Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Elkanen. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Black Friday edition of Benzinga's pre-market prep. Mr. Israel, as always, joined by Joel Elkan and Dennis Day. Um, hope everyone had a good holiday. Hope, hope you all have a relaxing Thanksgiving. Uh, today's, the story of today's show is retail, obviously, with Black Friday. So we're going to talk through the retail stocks uh, before and during our guest segment. Our guest today is Ryan Craver. He is our go-to, one of our go-to retail experts. He is the founder of Commerce Canal, works in the um, – Garment District in New York City. He'll break it all down for us today in 35 and tell us where the retailers stand. Uh, but in the meantime, Joel, uh, what is the word here in the overnight market? Crude is uh, crude is getting hit. Crude, crude is uh, in the red, but let's start with the S&P 500 futures. Uh, we had some carryover from that week close on Friday uh, during the abbreviated pre-market session. We continued to sell off. Uh, we made a pre-market low down at 26, 27. I uh, had a brief rally originally up to 56 and a quarter, but I'm just going to keep an eye on Friday's close at 49 even. Uh, pre-market low, 26, 27. The only thing under that was our October 29th low of 26.03. Uh, crude oil getting hit as well, down $2.52 at 52.11. Just trading off the low of 51.73. Gold in the red also by 580 at 1222.30. Silver in the red as well by uh, 26 cents at 14.24. And I didn't even have Bitcoin up yet here. Bitcoin down $140 at 4,235, clinging to the $4,000 levels. Here we are, Dennis, uh, abbreviated session today uh, in the S&Ps, 1 o'clock, and uh, it looks like there's uh, some sellers out uh, Wednesday night during Thanksgiving, came back this morning. What are you seeing in the pre-market action? Uh, seeing some red on the screen. <laughs> this day can go either way. Sometimes it can be crickets, and sometimes it can be wild because there's a lot of traders that don't trade on this day. So what that means is there's less players out there, which means there's less liquidity. So if you get a couple players that want in and out of a stock, they can really push the price around. I'm going to lean towards the latter and think this stock, this day is going to kind of be wild and not crickets because we've had volatility coming in. Obviously, volatility is still up. And with less liquidity today, I think you could see some really wild swings here. So I'll be trading most of the day here. We do close early at 1 o'clock. Um, obviously, after our session, I believe closes at 4, 4 or 5 o'clock. i got to look it up there. But um, it's definitely one of those days where there's less liquidity and sometimes some pretty wild little movements. Uh, you going to reduce size at all? Trade less no, stocks? No, I've actually <laughs> increased my size right now because the trading has been so good. Like if I went and looked at my sheet, I think – the last two months, and this is just from a day trading perspective, because, you know, obviously I trade market neutral. I short a lot of stocks. I'm not maybe not like a lot of, you know, other traders out there that are primarily long based. I'm net neutral, so I'm long short. And, uh, and, uh, and sometimes on these, you know, wild swings, sometimes I'm even more short than long. But um, the last two months have been my best two months in about five years. So, and which is typical. I've always said my P&L is very correlated to the VIX. When the VIX is up at 22 compared to 11 or 12, I'm usually making twice as much money with my trading because the moves are twice as big. VIX ever goes up to 30 or 40 and I'll make three times as much as I usually do. It's pretty, it, it's pretty consistent it's because my strategies are more arbitrage based. So it's just more inefficiencies out there. So I make more money. All right. How is, uh, speaking of that, um, What's this, Virtue? That that was the stock that uh, kind of mimics your trading? Yeah, What's that's that? one of the biggest posi positions in my investment portfolio here now. Um, I, I think they're, they're going to kill it on the quarter. I think they're going to rock this quarter because I'm sorry. all this trading, like, and, and I honestly think they're probably, they're doing 
they're, they're doing everything I'm doing. They're just doing it, you know, very scaled and they're doing, you know, obviously their own stuff too. You know, they're doing, taking advantage of any efficiencies on a millisecond scale too, which I'm not doing. So I ought to think they're really kicking some butt right now. So VIRT, I've been accumulating this entire, well, I've been accumulating for the last three, four months, but I've been accumulating on every pullback and it's been pulling back a little bit with the market here, even on Friday, pulled back a little bit as well. But I think the stock's going to rock this last quarter. So um, it's one of the biggest positions in my long-term investment portfolio. And uh, boy, oh boy, we are, uh, I like this daily setup here, Dennis. I'm not sure if uh, you're looking at your, I know it's in your long-term portfolio, but. Uh, yeah, boy, try not to look at those because I sell them. <laughs> yeah, last four highs uh, between 26, let's call it, uh, let's just call 26.75 five-star resistance here. You've had four or five highs in that area, uh, knocking on the door. We closed at 2583, but keep a real close eye on 2675 if you want to trade this uh, on a shorter term basis. So uh, let's just talk Mr. Market here, Dennis. Uh, I, uh, I I texted you uh, yesterday when the spoos were getting crushed. And, uh, why don't they close the futures? on? Why do the futures trade on the Thanksgiving? Why? Why? Yeah, like it's like as in a, like they don't trade on the weekend. Why do they trade on Thanksgiving Day? I'm just curious. Do you know why? I, I they do it. trade. They traded yesterday. Right. They traded. Uh, they uh, reopened at six, and then they trade till noon, and then they close. Why? I don't have an exact answer for you. Yeah, because it's a holiday. Like, do they? They don't trade on Christmas, do they? No. They reopen uh, on the 26th. So I'm just curious as to why they trade on Thanksgiving. It's I find it weird that S and P futures actually trade on Thanksgiving. Yeah, they, yeah. Spinner is saying global markets aren't closed, but the S and P is still based. Like S and P futures aren't global; they're U.S. So I'm not sure why S and P futures would trade. Would trade. Like I get, you know, why the world markets are trading. I get why all the other markets are open, but I don't totally understand why S and P futures trade on on a. I don't on know. Market. I don't have an exact answer for you, but they're... it's only a U.S. holiday. That's what they're saying. But the S and P futures are a U.S. product based on the 500 companies in the S and P. So um, I, I, I don't know. I've just always wondered that. Maybe it's because it's the most widely traded product, I think, you know, out there. So maybe they want it open for the rest of the world. But I just find it weird. Did they always trade on Thanksgiving? Do you remember, Joel? If it's always yeah, been open on Thanksgiving? I think Thanksgiving? so. Yeah. I think since Globex started in uh, June 25th, 1992, <laughs> the exact same day as Dana's birthday, and Dana was born, uh, they have. And uh, just because they can, I guess, right? This is they yeah. can be open and uh, there's real good liquidity. You see some good moves. I mean, the volume yeah. that's reflected right now. Uh, but um, man, oh man, I, it sure doesn't feel like that 2603, the low that we made at the end of October. It just doesn't look like it's going to hold up, Dennis. It just, and that's, that's the rotation. Of, and, you know, and go. I've said, I think we had capitulation in the Momos. We definitely did not in the other names. And there was capitulation, which was, or there was rotation, which was very apparent on, and I keep saying Friday because it feels like, a, you know, it was like the weekend, but it was Wednesday. And you saw them rotating. We talked about this on the pre pre market show. I was saying stocks like Procter Gamble, I don't want no part of those. That thing just got rocked. Coca Cola got rocked again. So two day, you know, two days ago. Coca-Cola was $50.84. Now $48.73 as the, the trade came off for the risks. Everybody that was hiding in those defensive names got rocked here the last two trading days. So I think those stocks have topped out. I've also been on the record saying I think NVIDIA and I think some of the Momo names like Square had their wash out there two days ago. Where it goes a week from now, I don't know, but we've had a nice spike here. I tend to think still maybe the lows are in for those stocks. Uh, but, you know, obviously that's to be determined. I think we're going to retest and I actually might try to buy some of those stocks on the retest of my invest portfolio. But the stocks like Coca-Cola, Procter Gamble, Johnson, Johnson, I think those topped out. So on any rally, I think I'm selling the strength. I said this on, on Wednesday's show. J&J &J was trading up 145 oh. and change. That opened and it went straight down. And that's just, you know, you just think about it. Like that's where defensive money was hiding. And the rotation, as much as the rotation for the last like feel like two years has been keeping us higher. You know, we've been talking about that. Like, you know, the market, you know, we get certain stocks selling off, but they rotate into other stocks. The rotation is almost keeping us down now. So it's actually the opposite problem because you had a really good day, you know, for, you know, a really good bounce back day and a couple of stocks like NVIDIA and Square, you know, it's NVIDIA jumped, you know, from the lows there where it opened there on Tuesday morning. 
jumped up to 100 and then the next day 155 dollars you had 20 point rally in nvidia from the lows now that's just a snapback rally call it dead cat bounce whatever you want but they held up we were talking about that on wednesday's show square held up they really didn't sell off with the overall market as the s ps showed weakness and that was because the other stocks the defensive names in the s p were bringing us down so as much as the rotation was keeping us higher for the last couple of years the rotation is now keeping us lower, and that's just you know apparent that we are still in this bear market. So despite you know me saying I think you know we washed out in Square Nvidia, we've got a long ways to go down on some of these other names. So I think on rallies, even like a McDonald's, like McDonald's, just look at that chart, Joel. Does that not look like it's ready to roll over and die? <laughs> it did. And uh, the interesting thing with J and J is it hit. Uh, I was talking with Brent about this on. Uh, Let's go Wednesday here and uh, no news, no nothing. Just hit an all time high. Someone says, hey, you know, get me out of a half a million and, you know, sell it down to 140 and change if you have to. And that's the kind of orders the institutions get. And uh, so that one and, and I also is not going back on my monthlies, but the last three or four times this stock made an old new all time high. It was the same scenario. It just runs out of buyers after, you know, after these kind of runs and then. They're kind of thinner stocks, too. Um, I just wanted for traders of NVIDIA here, uh, you know, I'm just going to do the simple math on this one. Uh, you had a low, a washout low at 133.31. You had a rally on Wednesday to 155.30. That's easy, 22. Yeah. Half yeah. of that is 11, 144. Where are you trading right now? Right One, now. Around 43.75 here. So, if, Do you think the low is in on a stock like this, or you think it's going to retest that 133? Uh, I'm just trying. I'm torn here because I'd like to get a few of these names. I would like Nvidia in my investment portfolio long term, but it's still trading 19 or 20 times forward earnings. It's not cheap compared to some of the other semi stocks, but it's always been best of breed. If it continues, you know, if we turn around and start getting a Santa Claus rally or something, this will be a stock that leads the way. The question is. If the S and P start to roll over, I mean, you know, can it hold up? And that S and P chart, I guess we should just start, you know, from going back before I ask you that question. I mean, you look at the Qs, even, you know, maybe it's a better indicator where he's talking to stock like Nvidia. I mean, we made a new low on the Qs. The Qs chart does not look healthy at all. It's still a downtrend. So maybe when you just look at the broad market, even though you know, yeah, you probably had it a little bit overdone a couple of days ago in Nvidia. Uh, I don't know if I'm, 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 I don't know if I want to come in here and buy it. Uh, well, here's another reason why I might be a little uh, a little hesitant on something like Nvidia. Um, what, what's going to happen with uh, end of the year here? I mean, you know, there's some people sitting on some losses here because this stock spent the majority of the year above two hundred dollars. Anybody chasing it is not going back to two hundred soon. You know, is it time? Gave back a year and a half of gains in forty five days. Right. Uh, a year and a half of, and not talking little gains, like it was up over a hundred percent in the last year and a half. It gave that all back in 45 days, not 45 trading days, like 30 trading days, like 45 calendar days. Cause we made our high in NVIDIA. This is incredible. Really. When you think about it, we made the all time high. What was it? 292, 76. Is that what you got? All time high. Uh, was, the, yeah. October second. Yeah, exactly. Two nights. October second. Now November twenty third. And you know, and obviously the, the washout low is back on November twentieth. So yeah, literally a month and a half later, it, it lost that. It's incredible that it can lose that much that fast. Uh, you know, and it, it, we talk about, you know, have we had the washout or not? And they're talking to CNBC. I haven't seen it yet. That NVIDIA down seventy points in three days felt like a washout. You know, I I think it was, but uh, it may not be. I mean, the overall market still doesn't look healthy. So I'm very torn. I, I want to buy a stock like NVIDIA and stick a little bit in the long-term portfolio, but still 19 times earnings. That, uh, that's the, that was a market multiple a little while ago, but and yeah, that was the one really down. favored. But you know, you cut it in half. It's getting attractive on a valuation basis, like a little more attractive, but it's still not cheap. Not by any means. I was talking uh, with Kolb over at the water cooler, and he was telling me that one of his buddies wiped out uh, – 10 years of gains in his portfolio in the last 45 days. And that's just people oh, that much then. If you're wiping that much out, you've how many years of gains? He said 10. Lost 10 years of gains in 45 days? I that's what he said. What is he doing? What is he doing over well, there? People are on margin. They're too much. They get bigger, bigger. You know, I've talked about this, Spencer, on the show. 
And this is the difference, you know, with, you know, people who are buying the dip. And we've had a few people on here and they say, oh, I just buy the dip and it always comes back. If you're employing that strategy on margin, these stocks not come back. I mean, and you're blowing out your account. Like on an NVIDIA, you're blowing out your account because if you're at two to one margin, stock falls 50%, it's game over. You're at zero, it's, it's over. So this is the risks of using margin. It's worked very well for traders for the last seven, eight years. We've been pretty much straight up, you know, since really 2011. We've had a couple of blips in there, but this is what a bear market's all about. It wipes people out that are just blindly. And a lot of people think they've, they've got the holy grail because they've been buying stocks on dips and they always come back and they think they have it all figured out. Well, that works in a bull market, and we've had just this, a, such a long-term bull market that people are, you know, thinking that they're, they're extracting alpha when they're just really getting the gains of the market, or a little bit better than than that if they're in the higher, you know, beta names. But in the long-term sustainability of trading, you've got to be able to trade both ways, in my opinion. Especially if you're going to be a trader, if you're going to be an investor, it's a different story. I always say don't invest on margin because I don't like it when the market falls 50 percent and you lose your account. So I never invest on margin, but I trade on margin. And you've got to be able to go both ways. And this is why I trade market neutral. So when the market falls 4 or 5%, I'm not getting hit. I'm, you know, actually, usually I'm, I'm doing better in the, in, the, in the down market. So you've got to be able to trade both ways. You've got to be able to short stocks too, in my opinion, as a trader. Because if you're just going long bias, you're, you're, you're going to have a real rough time in, this, in, a, in a bear market. And these bear markets can last a while, folks. I know, um, you know some people, but you know, 2007 and 2009 was probably the worst bear market that we had seen since... I don't even know. It was way worse when you add it all up than the 87 crash because the 87 crash, it came back, you know, six, nine months later. That financial crisis wiped out on a lot of stocks, 80%, 90%. You know, Citigroup going from $50 to two bucks. Bear Stearns basically going off the board, had to get bought out. Lehman Brothers going off the board to zero. Now, we're not in that situation here, but I'm saying as a trader, you have to be prepared to go both ways. Do you not, Joel? Oh, I mean, the, the problem is that, or I won't say a problem, but, you know, back at Bright, back, you know, in the 2000s, I mean, the the down markets, are. I mean, if you're experienced in them, they're, they're I don't want to say easier to make money, but, you, you make know, more money. Yeah. What, what a stock. You make it quicker. Yeah. So the stocks down faster than they go up. Yeah. Like, look at, uh, just to give an example here in uh, NVIDIA, I mean. People were selling the whole way up there. I mean, you know, and they were wrong. People took off a chunk at 250, 260. You had some declines at 270, 280. So there were sellers. So, yeah, you went up. You had these big up moves, but there were sellers. They were either rotating, taking profits, trying to short the stock or whatever. But when things start to go down, there's just not, you know, Unless the shorts are really willing, you know, to to cover, and you do don't have those short covering rallies, yeah. there's just a less inclined, and then you get to retail. Yeah. Oh, oh, it pulled. You back have a great 200. quote that you said to me, and I think you're looking for that quote. It was always, and I remember you teaching this. And if you if you're not on the show, Joel was actually my first mentor. He taught me to trade, kind of 1999. Took me under his wing. I was a little young, little 22 year old, just out of university, and Joel taught me a lot of things. And I can always remember what you said here, back to me, 1999. You said. Uh, there's always somebody willing to sell a stock that is going higher, but there's not always somebody willing to buy a stock that is going lower. Do you remember that? Yeah. I don't know where you got that from, <laughs> but that's why they go down so fast because you've always got people, you know, cause long bias, there's always got people willing to, you know, okay, I'm going to take my profits here or I'm making money. I'm going to get out. So as stocks are going up, you will find sellers, but when they're going straight down, Sometimes you don't find the buyers. And uh, just a perfect quote, you know, what a bull eats in a year, uh, you know, a bear can scarf in a day. And that's well, they do. And that's why they go down so much faster than they go up. So if you can make money, and I still think that's why a virtue financial will be playing it both ways. I'd imagine a lot of their strategies are market neutral. Like I said, all of my, all of my trading strategies are market neutral. When I come in, I'm usually hedged overall where i've kind of got equal longs equal shorts you know and i'll use spy or cues to equal that out you know maybe i've got a long biased on some stocks but i'll use I'll, then i'll short some spy or some cues against it just to even it up and you know and i'm trying to extract the alpha the inefficiencies of my strategies if i'm just flat out long 
well, then I'm just long. I might as well just be long SPY because I'm going to move with the market. I mean, today, if I just was, if I wasn't market neutral and I was long some retail stocks, SPY is to SPY because I just tip day, typically from a seasonality perspective, retailers outperform on this day. I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, me and my one buddy at Bright said, well, we got to play. We play it every year. So I'm long some retailers and I'm short, you know, the overall market here against it. Kind of working this morning because I've got a few retailers that are actually trading higher, but um, you know that's the, that's the strategy. The whole point of that is I'm trying to extract that uh, you know any efficiency of the seasonality of you know this being a good day for retailers. So if I just flat out you know own those stocks and and don't have any S and P short against it, I'm probably losing money today because I you know on down day everything's kind of going to go lower. But what I'm looking for is an outperformance of retail stocks versus the S and P. That's the alpha that I'm trying to extract today. All right, let's uh, let's take a, a look at crude here real quick. We got, I mean, I someone's asking me for levels on crude, and I don't even know what to say. It's down another three bucks. Uh, it's unbelievable. Three, yeah, I, I this is totally you know caught me off guard. I haven't tried to buy it, but uh, you know sometimes I can get involved in some of these uh, oil stocks or the USO, and yeah. it's just getting absolutely crushed. Everyone. It just seems like relentless the selling. How yeah. many days in a row are we down in the USO? Oh man, it, uh... it's a it, it's it's crazy. But you know, we've had a couple up days in there. But I mean, what is there one in the last month and a half? What do we have? Like four or five up days, and they're like very small. If you got short this, this is just a trend that is like just relentlessly lower, and it just keeps getting worse. It keeps getting worse for oil traders. And, you know, I'm probably taking a hit in my invest portfolio because I have a lot of Canadian stocks and I have a lot of energy stocks because Canada is like 30 percent oil. Canadian stocks are massively, massively getting hit here right now because it's oil. It's oil related. The majority of you know Canadian stocks revolve somehow around oil. Even if you look at the Canadian banks, they're getting hit. Because why? They got all money loaned to oil companies. Exactly. So, you know, you look at a bank in Nova Scotia, that's from $60 down to 53. Conservative bank pees like 10. Dividend yield on the thing is like 4.89%. But they probably got a lot of, they're out west, big out west. They're, they're everywhere, but they're big out west too. They probably got a lot of oil loans. If the oil continues to go down, could have problems like we were talking about back a couple of years ago at the early 2016, where some of these oil companies might actually go out of business. And uh, that's a, a putting a big pressure on the market. Uh, man, I just, I mean, you got at this point, uh, a buck away from the 50, $50 level. We are trading, uh, we're trading down 327, 330 here at 5134. Uh, let me go to the weeklies here. Boom, 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 boom. I don't know. I did. Let's see. These some weekly lows are down. Man, you have to go far back. I'm just gonna say fifty bucks for right now. Uh, fifty two, fifty three was your low in November, but then your following month low was forty seven, sixty seven here. So just wait for like a double bottom and or a couple closes in the same area. But that is, you better check some of those uh, some of those uh, uh, oil stocks there that you're holding here because. Well, uh, that's what I said. I've got yeah. Canadian ones. I don't have really any individual oil stocks. Very few, but I've got I've got some ET energy ETFs. Okay. Canada. I've also got a lot of Canadian ETFs, which are very exposed to oil, probably thirty or forty percent. So I'm going to get hit in those, and I'm getting hit in those. And I should have been checking them, I guess, a month and a half ago when they were doing really well, and should have been maybe lightening up. But again. I'm, you know, long term on some of this stuff. Um, you know, obviously, I wish I didn't have any energy in my portfolio here right now, but I do. I don't know what it is overall exposure. Maybe sometimes I should figure that stuff out. But, you know, my stocks, when the market goes down, I'm going to lose money in my invest portfolio. My, my long term portfolio is long based. I've never really been, you know, a fan of shorting stocks in the long term because I do believe, you know, over the course of, you know, 20, 30 years, stocks go higher. That's why in the long term, I've always been an investor. It's why, you know, I've actually made money in my long term portfolio over the last 20 years, because when I started investing, the Dow was sitting around 9,000. Dow is sitting around 26,000 here now. So has it been a fantastic 18 years of investing or 19 nope. years of investing since I've started? Not really. I mean, when you look at that performance of the Dow, what are we up? 150 percent, 19 years. What is that annualized to? Maybe 5 percent. Not that great. But we've had some main, massive, massive drawdowns in there where, you know, we had a nice run up from, you know, 1999, 2000. We got hit in 2000, 2001. The tech, you know, bubble burst. And then in the financial crisis, 
it seems like every eight or nine years we just have you know this massive sell-off here and we're starting to see one again i don't know what they're going to call this one maybe it's just high flyers don't fly so high anymore because i don't really feel like it's like a financial crate i feel like it was just so overdone that it was needed but it came they came off so fast like the nvidias and the squares and stuff that it almost feels like a crash in those stocks which i guess it kind of is you know down, nvidia down 55 percent at the lows and in a month and 30 days it kind of feels like it was a mini crash at least what, for that stock yeah let's uh let's take a look at uh the big dog here to uh apple uh that's yeah that's that's off. And i own that in my long-term portfolio and i wish i would have sold it at 230 uh, 175.51 has been the recent low of the downturn. We are trading at that level right now. And this is just, you know, we don't do fancy technical analysis here. But when you see this candle here between 160 and 180, that's a weekly candle. I just, I just don't like the, I just don't want to be caught long in something like that because there's not a lot of price memory here. And uh, so if you're looking, um, you know, longer term in Apple, you know, the bottom of that uh, that candle was 165.27. And you know what? We're not that we're not that too far away from it. So, uh, you know, the iPhone, you know, whether or not that that's topped out. I mean, there's all indications from the company that it may be. But, you know, if you talk to someone like Gene Munster, they have, you know, they have services, they had, you know, they're. They've, they've done a lot of things right, but the iPhone is what's led them up to this level, and now it's it's actually, it's a drag on the stock. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to sit and fight this candle right here. I don't know if we're going to get down to the 160 area, but uh, you got to respect that you know the weekly lows and and monthly lows. When you get to these kind of perspectives, if you're looking at the dailies, you're going to say you know oh, I'm leaning on that 175.51. That's going to be the bottom. It's not going to work that way. It's it's just uh, you know it's it's just not that easy. I I don't know. I'll be waiting for one sixty in this one. I think it's going to see one sixty as well. Yeah. Here I am talking against my books. I own this in a long term portfolio, but I have none of this in my trading portfolio. But it's come so far down here now that one sixty, like we used to add prices memory. That level kind of jumps out. I remember Harlan Pines. They bring up the daily chart or weekly chart. What level jumps out at you? When I look at that on a weekly basis, I see one sixty. I think I could see it. All right, uh, S and P's. I'm not jumping in here and buying more right now. I might at 160. I might get interested. I mean, at a certain point in time, the cash that Apple has just you know maybe make some sense. But S and P's continue to roll over here. Yeah, 2635 down 14. What's uh, the low of the move? Uh, 2603. You're right. You're getting close. Yeah, 32 handles. In the last two times we were down this area, we really popped out of there. Uh, so let's. Uh, do we we really don't have Spencer? Are you still around? You there is asleep? some news. Where is hey? Uh, I'm still I'm still here. We do have a little bit of uh, I guess you can call it retail news this morning. I, I just saw a headline coming through the wires at uh, Overstock.com. The CEO Patrick Burns said plans to sell the retail business by February. Is that stock acting at all? It is. It's up five point seven percent here this morning, getting a lift. A tie on a stock like this, every time it spikes up, it's a selling opportunity. And I don't see why this is any different here. I don't follow the company closely from a fundamental basis, but the trend is definitely not your friend. Just looking at technicals, until this can get over 20 and hold 20, it's really not of any interest to me. So I think I'm a seller of rips as opposed to buyer of dips. So if they're selling stock or selling you know, parts of the company trying to save themselves cash. It's never a sign of a healthy company here. So I like to sell the rip on this one. Wasn't this one going to create like their own trading stocks through Bitcoin or something like oh, that? Oh, this was a Bitcoin like darling back, back at the beginning of the year. This stock started, Joel, in January 12th, the stock was $89. It's, six, it's 16 bucks now or it's 17 in the pre-market because of the lift. $89 first week of January this year. So you want to talk about stocks that had a bad year? There's pretty much none. There's very few that have had a worse year than Overstock.com. And everybody's buying the hype. I mean, when Bitcoin was blasting off in October, November, December 2017, they were like, this is the way to play it, Overstock.com, if you're trading it. Well, we know Bitcoin went from 20000 to 4000 Overstock went from $89 down to 16 here. So um, end of the day, 
you know, if you were playing this for, you know, as a Bitcoin play, maybe it worked because Bitcoin lost, what, 70% of its value and this has lost just as much. Do you know it's uh, almost one year ago we did our, our Bitcoin special in uh, like a December 23rd. We should, uh, maybe we should uh, get back Joe Sluzy and Jim Angel and uh, a few other people. Maybe that'll there. be the bottle. Yeah. No, I, we'll see. I mean, that, that was... Oh, Dennis. <laughs> All right. I'm, not, I'm not coming here and buying Bitcoin hand over fist. So <laughs> if you would listen to this show, you know, we've been Bitcoin bears. We're bears all the way up, bears all the way down. So we just stayed bearish Bitcoin. I guess in the long run, we were, we, we seem to be right here. But uh would have been a lot of short-term pain if we were actually shorting it. So I'm glad I'm not a crypto trader. because I probably would have been losing a lot of money in October, November, December of 2017 when I had that ridiculous, ridiculous run up. And I'll call it this. That was just crazy. What about the Tom Lee guy? What's his name? The one guy. Well, what about the Litecoin guy? Who is the Litecoin founder? Remember him? And right at the top in January, he sold all of his Litecoin at like $390 because he, and he was the founder of Litecoin. And his reasoning was, oh, it's a conflict of interest for me to own this because I'm always talking about Litecoin. Well, you like invented it. I mean, you, you're, you're telling me that's like the CEO selling all his stock saying, well, I'm running the company, so it's a conflict of interest. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. We talked about it on this show, and I think we even like, kind of hinted, if this didn't spell a top, I don't know what did, and that was the very top of it all. I don't know where that Litecoin is now, but it was a ridiculous thing you know, to say. If you want to sell it all, you know, say, yeah, it's overdone, and you know it's not worth what it is, and you just want to book your profits, but don't make some excuse that it's a conflict of interest, and, oh, I'm still going to run, and I'm still, but I can't have money in this. That was the top. That was ridiculous when the founder of it sells it all. And, you know, and the Ripple, remember the Ripple, you know, founder or whatever? He was the richest man in the world for like one day there over Bezos. It got just so silly, guys. And that's what these things can do. They can get silly. And, you know, obviously bubbles burst and that bubble burst. And, and I don't think this stuff's ever coming back. Like if you're holding on thinking, you know, Ripple's going to come back to wherever it was. And Litecoin's come back. This stuff was all just fluff. It was really like, what? what is it? I mean, maybe Bitcoin, you know, maybe some of the main ones might, you know, eventually come back somewhat, but all these other small little coins and stuff, I think most of these are zeros. All right. Uh, what about imbalances? Uh, did imbalances come out there? Kind yeah, of they did. Let's go check them out. There, and here, you got the holiday trade. I don't even see anything, right? Pfizer, 93,000 to sell. Maybe a little bit of continuation. Pfizer did show a little bit of weakness last couple of days. Again, it's been a place where defensive money has been hiding um, and I own Pfizer, my long-term portfolio. I've been tempted to ring the register on some of this because some of these moves are pretty good. I mean, Pfizer, I bought this thing back at like 20s and, you know, and uh, I think I'm in it at $14 or something like that. It's been a pretty good five, six years for Pfizer, uh, on the run up there. And Merck, uh, you know, a lot of these things, you know, I did lighten up my Merck position because I just had so much Merck. It had run up so much. It just was more of a balancing act because it was starting to take over my portfolio because I'd bought it like $25, $30. And it just run up, run up, run up. And it was one of my biggest positions when I bought it because I was really a believer in the company. It was when I was yielding 6%. I, I put a good chunk of my money in Merck and Lilly back in like 2011 or 2012. And both of those stocks were on one unbelievable performance. I think about Lilly at $31. It's 112, but I, I ended up selling, I think, most of it. I, I got out of it all now, I think, in the high 80s. But sometimes, you know, you just got to rebalance when you're a long-term investor. When you get the port certain stocks taken over your portfolio, sometimes you have to ring the register. I know you got to pay the tax guy when you do that, but it's a lot better than the alternative. You know, on something like NVIDIA, if you were sitting on there, you didn't want to pay the tax guy, then you watch all your gains go away. It's like, hmm, wish I would have paid the tax guy. All right. Well, all right. we're going to talk some retail, Spencer, here. Why don't we... Uh... Take a quick break and uh, dial up Ryan Craver. Yep, let's do that. Ryan Craver is the uh, founder of Commerce Canal. We'll be right back in a moment with Ryan.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. We are joined now, as promised, by Ryan Craver. He is uh, our retail guru. He's the founder of Commerce Canal. Ryan, how's it going today? Fantastic. Happy Friday, guys. Happy Black Friday. Yeah. Is today like is today your favorite day of the year? It really is. I mean, I'm I'm staring at an office with no one here, so I'm getting a lot of work done and tweeting away on on what we're seeing from the Shopify sites and all the Amazon businesses that we're running. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Black Friday. All right. Well, we got uh, a chart of the retailers that are reported this far. Let's just go back to, to earnings, and then we can talk about what you're seeing out there at Black Friday. All the retailers that are reported this far, uh, boy, oh, boy, it's been pretty ugly. Uh, Off-price stores, dollar stores, department stores, warehouse, and the mass. Tell our listeners what they're looking at here, Ryan. Absolutely. I, I think uh, we ran hot and heavy uh, into earnings. I think expectations were to, to see some significant improvements in sales and profit, profitability. We did see the sales increases that, uh, that were expected, but for whatever reason, we've traded down significantly. I think what's interesting to me is if you start to look at, at the mass brands like the Walmarts and the Target. Walmart last quarter came off their best comp sale uh, in over 10 years. And so they then had their next uh, comp in Q3 that was slightly below that. It wasn't terrible, nothing to worry about, uh, but it just didn't measure up to the, the best comp in 10 years. Target, on the other hand, um, had a very, very strong comp uh, last quarter, and they, they came in with their best quarter in 13 years. Uh, and this recent quarter that was slightly below that. So we're still seeing very strong sales, but both of those players came back and said e-commerce has definitely been an impact on their overall profitability. Um, and I think that's why everyone's trading down because there, there just hasn't been any strong forward guidance from any of these guys. Uh, but compare that to last year where they were Posted negatives or one to two percent, and they're all posting three to five percent in comps. I, I think it's it's going to be a generally uh, favorable Q4, uh, but there's not a lot of optimism out there as it stands. Uh, certainly not. So let's uh, let's go to uh, the carnage here um, and a lot of these a lot of these stocks here and uh, see if uh, any of them are worth uh, worth picking up here, Ryan. Uh, let's. Uh, Let's start here with, um, I don't know, let's start with something that really got hit, uh, Target. Uh, anything that you're interested in in Target? So I actually like Target relative to Walmart. I think if you look at Target, what's impressive to me is last quarter, 6.5 comp. This quarter, 5.1 comp. That compares to last year when they were posting anywhere from one negative one and a half to 0.9. So the turnaround story is there. Um, what was interesting to me uh, as well is that their uh, e-commerce is growing a lot faster than Walmart's, not on a total dollars basis, but on a percentage basis. So in the latest quarter, 1.9% of that 5.1% comp was driven by e-commerce. That's a much larger percentage or proportion than Walmart. So I think that they're doing a little bit better in e-commerce as a percentage of their total business. Um, they traded down significantly. I mean, they're down to 69. It's, it's, it's a difficult looking chart. I think that this might be a bit of a bottom here. If I was to play Walmart versus Target, I'd probably go with Target. Walmart, on the other hand, not as strong in terms of growth. Uh, and they also have that looming JD.com uh, invest mistake they took in China. China obviously is believed to be slowing down a bit, even though they had a very strong singles day. But they also have a CEO uh, who has gotten in trouble with the law in Minneapolis. So I like Target. Okay, so you like Target. And uh, also Gene Munster has been on our show uh, quite a few times. And he still thinks that uh, Amazon may show some interest in that stock, if, you know, to get back into the more of the uh, brick and mortar. Uh, let's do a this question, when someone like Walmart, you know, they go into like a JD.com or something, is that just something that they're they're in and like they're never going to sell? Is this, or is that something that, you know, they may, you know, you don't know for all the matter. They, they could have sold some of their stock, right? Or is that just something where they make the investment and they just hold on forever? 
I I think they're probably going to hold on for the foreseeable future just because that is their stake in China. Um, they believe that their one big difference to Amazon in their international uh, play is that they have that JD stake. Amazon has tried to win in China, but it's it's failed um, miserably. Uh, and Walmart does have stores in China. So I think that that's part of their story to have a foothold in China. Obviously, the battlefield in India has the top two e-commerce guys going against each other. So they're fighting there. But this is the one place that Walmart is doing better than Amazon. All right. Uh, let's move on to some of the other big department stores. Nord Nordstrom's. Boy, oh, boy. That yes. stock got pounded here. They had these nice. I mean, did you see any of this? I mean, it just it started and you thought, holy mackerel, this can't continue this way. Uh, Nordstrom once a uh, just a few weeks ago, a sixty eight dollar stock now here uh, dipped under 50. I remember that was the, the price that, uh, you know, the company was defending and talking about going private here. Uh, is there any safety here in Nordstrom? Yeah, I think if anyone's got safety, it's probably them just because they had been talking about going um, private around the 50 range. With that said, you look at the underlying business, they're full line stores. So their higher tier stores are struggling mightily. I mean, last quarter, they posted a 4.1% comp that dropped to 0.4 this quarter. So that's their most profitable chain uh, within their offering. Uh, you look at the rack, the rack actually did very, very well. It's at a 5.8% comp uh, this quarter. So I'm not excited about it. I wouldn't say it's the best play. I do believe they're the best operating retailer. I also believe, uh, department store, excuse me. I also believe that they are doing the best job in e-commerce because now 30% of their sales are coming from e-commerce, but there's nothing to get me that excited here. Um and uh, if you want to take a small bet, I think you, you're a little bit safer here just because of that underlying uh, bid to go private. All right. That's the P futures just made a new low here at uh, 26, 26. Uh, the former low of uh, or the low from the uh, pre-market session was 26, 27. All right. So let, let's move into Black Friday sales here. And uh, first of all, like, how do you monitor them? How do you get your results? And uh, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, so my company is currently supporting roughly 53 brands on Amazon. So we're obviously watching the comps year over year, month over month, very closely. That's one barometer of knowing how well we're doing uh, on Amazon, which currently owns about 48% of the market share in the U.S. for e-commerce. Uh, so that's that's a great way of finding out how they're doing. The second way is, is we monitor a lot of our Shopify feeds as well as Shopify's public data that they provide it's called the BFCM tracker. Uh, you just do a quick Google search. You can see how their merchants are doing. And that gives us a good indication of anyone outside a marketplace like Amazon or Walmart. Um, and then lastly, we follow a lot of the Adobe data to see how they're doing. Um, um, beyond that, we will do some store checks to make sure that we have our clients comfortable to know how well uh, traffic's doing into the stores. I, again, I think that this is going to be a very strong, strong Q4 on the sales top line, but on the bottom line profitability, it's going to be pretty difficult. Uh, you know, you saw the data from yesterday. It looks like we were up about 17% year over year on Thanksgiving. So there was some shopping, which was good to see. Um, but uh, we shall see how, how we're going to do. Probably late Sunday, we should have a good indication how the entire cyber week is going to go. Um, but that's generally how we... Uh, focus on, uh, on the numbers. And you anticipating, you know, any, any big winners or big losers? I mean, you do have, you know, the Toys R Us uh, bankruptcy and, you know, where will those shoppers go? Or do, are people still using, uh, you know, still buying toys for kids? So uh, potential winners and losers here from uh, Black Friday and what's it? Cyber Monday? Yep. Yep. Cyber Monday, which really should be called Cyber Week because the, the sales extends through the following Friday. Um, I think big winners, the obvious ones uh, are definitely going to win. I'm a big fan of Amazon. I okay. think that, you know, despite the nosebleed valuation, I think that this is a great place to pick it up. Uh, everything that we track on them in terms of sales, in terms of marketing, which is a, a very, very strong indicator of 
better margins next quarter, uh, is doing very well. I think Lululemon is a name that's poised for a lot of growth. They continue to pull more sales out of their stores and do a great job online. I think to your point, uh, guys that are losing market share, so the Sears, the Toys R Us, obviously, because of the closed stores, a lot of that's going to gravitate to the big ones. Uh, I'm a big fan of Target, as you've heard me. I think they're going to post another 5 plus percent comp at Q4, which should be very, very strong. Um, and, and those are kind of the three big names. I think if you if you move outside of the mass, you've got some guys like TJX who are posting six and seven percent comps. I think they're going to ve- do very strong as well. So I probably sound like a broken record because last I, time we spoke, okay. it's a lot of the same names. But that's all right. What about uh, what about your Costco here uh, trading down a buck fifteen to seventeen forty two? And uh, this is kind of scary looking chart here because. Uh, it had, Costco's dipped down uh, to this area, uh, you know, this 217, 218 area on four occasions. And just from a technical perspective here, uh, big breakdown. What's your place? I probably spend the most of my retail money is probably Costco because we go there and buy a big cart. And I mean, nowhere else do I go and spend two, three, four hundred bucks. But uh, give us your perspective on Costco, COST. I mean, Costco, you can you can see my chart. I mean, that is that is an incredible comp sale uh, position. I, I mean, excluding fuel, these guys have posted uh, uh, a 7.7 in Q1, a 7 in Q2, a 7.2 in, in Q3. So they're obviously seeing your your market share help them. I mean, this is this is incredible numbers. And you got to remember, they have that membership base behind yeah. them. So that is an incredible annuity that's going to pay itself forward like the prime effect. I think they're also starting to get uh, a firm grasp on e-commerce. I'm a big fan. I think to your point, though, you know, technically we look at this thing, it drops anywhere closer to 213. I know pre-market, it's getting close to there. We got some trouble. With that said, I'm a big fan of them as well. Hey, uh, Ryan, well, I have a quick question here, Ryan. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about the earnings, uh, the reaction to the earnings on this show. And the, the traders will do what the traders want to do. But do any of these of these post-earnings moves really make you scratch your head? Yeah, I think um, I think the Amazon move makes me scratch my head. The Costco move makes me scratch my head. The TJX uh, move makes me scratch my head. I mean, those three names are... You know, the you look at their numbers; they they posted phenomenal numbers. Um, you know, Amazon. It could be a number of reasons why they they saw that drop. Obviously, because of some of the news they've had, whether it's the Long Island City, Virginia thing, whether it's the China slowdown thing. Um, even though China's not an impact on them, uh, whether it's the Trump um, uh, rhetoric, it's it's just been difficult for them. Costco. I, I have no idea. I have no idea why it, it dropped. I would I would pick up here, um, and I'd probably even argue Target was was a bit overdone. The Macy's and the rest of the guys they posted stuff that or, or numbers that weren't amazing. However, I think that their drop wasn't wasn't uh, worthwhile either. Uh, we got a question here out of the chat from a uh, Donnie Hill Burlington Coat Factory. Be, is that is that what they still call it? Yeah, Burlington Stores. I mean, I'm looking at the monthly chart on this one. I'm like, oh man, why don't I just buy this thing on a dip? And here's another dip. It's uh, hanging in here in the pre market. Uh, any thoughts on Burlington Stores? Yeah, it's a good question. So Burlington, for whatever reason, always posts late in the quarter. So we've already seen numbers from Ross. We've seen numbers from TJ Maxx. I believe Burlington reports on the 28th. Um, I like them. I think they're the most frugal of the off-price guys. Um, you know, if I was to pick between, I think I told you guys this the last time, if I was to pick between TJX, uh, Burlington, or Ross, I'd probably buy them in, in that particular order. Uh, they posted a 2.9 uh, comp in the last quarter. I would hope we're going to get well above three in this in this latest quarter so we can return to the fours and the fives like we had in the preceding quarters. I I think a lot of the bad news of Ross is priced in. A lot of the bad news of TJ Maxx, even though there was no bad news, is priced in. So I'm a big fan headed into earnings. 
Uh, William Dunn, I, this is not really a retail stock, but he, he just, do you follow Procter? I mean, Procter and Gamble at all? I mean, they're, they make the stuff that retailers sell. Is that uh, a stock, a value stock that's had an amazing run? Is that something that you follow at all? Uh, I don't follow it at all. I mean, I, uh, other than the fact that we track a lot of the stuff that they sell on Amazon. Okay. With that said, I think, I think it's well ahead of itself. <laughs> for whatever it's worth. Okay. Yeah. They uh, definitely had a nice, a nice run up. Uh, let's see here if there's any more that we have in the chat. Oh, I want to ask you about like the, you mentioned a little bit about JD.com and Walmart and uh, the tariffs with China. I mean, is it hard to step into something like Alibaba until there's some kind of definity, you know, on, on what's, what's actually going on. I mean, there were some, uh, uh, supposed talks coming up. Uh, thoughts on Alibaba? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm actually a long-term bull of Alibaba. I think the numbers didn't didn't scare me at all. I mean, granted, they they brought down guidance a bit, but you you can't fight the scale of what they're building and the way in which they're building it. Keep in mind, they're an asset light model for the retail sales. They hold no inventory. Granted, they now have brick and mortar, so they're getting into more inventory, but the overwhelming business has no inventory. It's a strong return on capital. I'm a big fan of Alibaba. I think that they have a lot of room. And this is, what about these, uh, I'll, let, I'll let you go after this. What about these uh, these uh, gaming stocks? You know, this EA and ATVI. I mean, did they just hit their saturation point here? These stocks have a lot of two-for-one stocks mix as, uh, set for take two uh, interactive and that's starting to come off well here. Where do they fit into the retail picture? Yeah, so we we do track some of those. We don't sell a lot of games. Um, the, the, big, the big place that we've been very bearish on is GameStop for a long, long time. Um, I think I remember when we were on call a couple of years back, yep. that was still when I was in the 30s or 40s. Um, so we're very negative on that. If you look at the particular gaming stocks, the ones that we're seeing, a good index on Amazon is Take Two, um, ERTS, and ATVI. They they just came out with games that it seems like they were a bit rushed to make the holidays. They did not have good reviews in a lot of their games. If there's one place I'd I'd say that we're seeing positive indications, it's Take Two. All right, one more for you, then we'll let you go for sure. Foot Locker, a uh, good report. Man, blasted over $54. Nice move here. Is this a sustainable move in Foot Locker? Yeah, good question. I think uh, I personally did not get excited by the Foot Locker numbers. I think it's trading on, um, you know, a forward PE that, that is very attractive. With that said, don't get too excited about, uh, you know, a 2% comp increase year over year. I think that they are growing the business. They're doing it profitably. However, there's not a lot of growth here. I like other names within retail if you're if you're a growth investor. All right. We've been online with uh, Ryan Craver. He is our retail expert and uh, we really appreciate you having you on uh, this day. It's just working out perfect. So we'll uh, we'll maybe catch up with you around Christmas time here and uh, and uh, follow the progress of some of these retailers. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Fantastic guys. Have a great weekend. All right. Uh, S&P's uh, hanging here in a 2620 handle. Dennis, 2628, down $21. What are you seeing under the hood? I mean, is uh, our stocks trading uh, in, in conjunction? I see some of these Yeah, tax you know what? We're, I'm seeing a lot of – and oil stocks are just oh. getting rocked. Let's go to the oil charts. It's getting murdered here this morning once again. But let's go to individual stocks here this morning because I've got Exxon Mobil, the big gun of them all. Trade down two and a half percent. I've got Chevron trade down three points. Conoco Phillips is, is there news on Conoco? It's down another three points. COP that's a bigger move than the other ones are having. Um, it's I'm not sure if this is probably just all oil related, but the oil stocks are just getting absolutely crushed here this morning. So anything oil is not pretty. We might hit 50 bucks today, Dennis. We are now down 391 at 50. Where were we at the highs on crude? Like, like, a, like a month and a half ago. You talk about the NVIDIA like crash. There's been an oil crash. Where where do we go up to when we're at the highs? Uh, well, let's see. 70. Let's go to a, a monthly here. And uh, basis the uh, rolling front month contract. Like, like first week of October. Yeah. 
Uh, 77. 77 oh four. So you lost 33 percent basically in oil here in just over a month. I mean, that's you, incredible. Proof. You can say what I mean. Trump wanted loyal, lower oil. He got lower got oil. It. Yeah, I'd say that's one thing that. Uh, but uh, yeah, you have to start worrying about the debt, the paper, and uh, some of these companies. Uh, man, I remember playing Exxon Mobil short after so earnings. quick too. Yeah, holy mackerel! <laughs> I but you know what, what? What the oil? But the oil loss is usually the airliners' gain. So how have the airliners really? Let's let's go look at the love LUV, American Airlines, Delta. Yeah, they've held up. But really, when you put it into perspective, you can just tell how much this market's been ugly. I mean, they were all they're all down from where they were in the first week. So when oil was seventy seven bucks or seventy three dollars, whatever you just said, um, Delta Airlines at that time, first week of October was fifty eight. It's now fifty six. LUV was at that time sixty three. It's now fifty two. I mean, it's crazy to think that oil would fall 33% and the airlines would be down in that time. They've, they've rallied from the lows here that we had at the end of October, but man, is that not? It's not correlated. Is that wrong? Well, I would say UAL, though. Is this right? Has it held up better? Look at that. Yeah, UAL's done well. Oh, Why man. is it? Is it the way everybody's flying UAL now? I don't know. It should have pulled I thought chart. it's way in two weeks. <laughs> That's Spencer Israel keeping UAL flying. Oh boy, no! I should. I gotta take this off, man, because I am just too tempted to short this one here. I <laughs> knock it up there That's at ninety three dollars. We'll wait. I get fixated on stocks, but this is a this is a thin one uh, in the stock, so it's one you gotta be uh, gotta be careful. And, of. and Hunter making a good point. Some of the airlines do hedge themselves, and I don't follow the industry close enough to know which ones do. I believe LUV is a big hedger, so the ones maybe UAL doesn't have the hedges on. The futures, you know, where they were buying, you know, and then so they're obviously benefiting from the oil prices immediately, where some of the other ones that may have been hedged up don't benefit immediately. So, you know, that's one thing to think about there. Um, it's a, it's the hedging. If you follow the industry closely, um, maybe you'll know that. But I, I just remember from my thoughts, I thought LUV is a big hedger. So maybe that's why it doesn't do as well as a UAL when oil prices are getting the beats. Yeah, I think Delta does some uh, some hedging here, and that, that stock looks okay for now, flat here. Uh, it's come off that low under $50. All right, Dennis, uh, on this uh, short day, it looks like it's going to be a wild one here. I think uh, so. I think we're going to see some volatility. I think we're going to see some uh, some pretty good trading action. Remember, we close early as, at 1 o'clock, so you know, don't take off for lunch. Come back at 1.30 and say, whoa, I was supposed to get out of those day trades because you'll be closed at 1. There will be an after-hour session, I believe, some exchanges close at four, and I think I might have Arca might open till five, but I think it's all done at five o'clock for the after hour session as well. So if you're trading here, just remember one o'clock early close. All right, Spencer, you want to wrap things up here for uh, for this Friday yeah. here? Preview what we got going on next week. Yeah, well, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, again enjoyed their holiday. If you celebrated, and uh, hope you guys enjoyed the show today. And, Hope everyone has a good weekend. If you missed any part of our show, you can catch our podcast. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Google Play, or just really search for Benzinga or Premarket Prep on any of those platforms. Thanks to our guest, Ryan Craver, for joining us today. We love his insights, as always. Thanks to all of you who joined us on YouTube and premarket.benzinga.com. As far as Monday's show, we're going to be joined by uh, seeing sort of with the retail-ish theme. Michael Pactor will join us. He is uh, an analyst at Whitebush. He covers the video game stocks, EA, Activision Blizzard. Uh, we'll see on Take Two, uh, Netflix. Uh, so he's, he's got a lot of media. Video, video game stocks and his coverage. We'll talk to him about those stocks on Monday. That'll be at 8.35. But uh, last thing, please remember that everything we say on our show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice. Once again, I hope you all have a good weekend. And uh, we'll see you on Monday. Go Blue.